The year is 1936 and there's a storm gathering. Various nations around the globe are preparing for a second world war, as if they know it's going to happen ahead of time. This is the true story of World War II, 1938 to 1947. To nobody's surprise, our story begins in Germany. The date is the 11th of March 1936, and before Adolf Hitler can propose remilitarizing the Rhineland, a vicious coup has erupted, starting a civil war, led by the well-known and very old Field Marshal August von Mackensen. For the first and only time in its history, Germany will be divided between East and West. As an expert on history, I'm always being asked, you know, how did the war start? And my particular and very much unique insight is that Adolf Hitler was nuts, right? I mean, just, just crazy. And that his generals acted accordingly. Who knows what would have happened if he was allowed to continue past 1936? Well, probably very little, right? I mean, like, literally not much at all. Well, not unless he was appeased a whole bunch. The Civil War is going badly for Adolf Hitler, and once he sees the amount of notifications he's got coming in, he begins to despair. He launches a tirade of angry abuse at his generals, which in this case is fair enough, as they're all literally fighting against him. He then causes chaos on the battlefield, when he accidentally assigns his entire army to the border with Denmark. In his rage, he falls back on his remaining option. So Adolf Hitler just shoots himself, though he never had a chance to build a bunker. So he just, just shoots himself in the Reich Chancellery Garden, like right out there in the open. Then a dog got to the body. And, you know, unlike me in this outfit and with his hair, it was not pretty. Ah, Hitler, yeah, I used to work alongside him, yeah. Then Himmler took over and he was a real piece of work, you know, he, he made Terrible places. <sighs> Naval dockyards, mostly. Yeah, whilst his units were being encircled. <sighs> it's terrible. By the year's end, the civil war is over, and all of Hitler's once powerful entourage are imprisoned for life, as it was deemed that they might be useful later. Ah, all my cell ma my mates were, they were sure that Germany was going to become a democracy after that, but uh, no, it wasn't to be. They drove the Americans crazy what happened next. I think they needed the world tension. Oh, Margarita, thank you. The United States of America are bored of waiting for the game to get going, and surprise everybody by deciding it's time to put America first. Just as they take a swing to the right, Kaiser Wilhelm II is reinstated as the leader of Germany. The Americans panic, there's a chance Germany might indeed start trouble, but it's too late for the United States to change their mind as they've already pressed the button. America is now set on the path of the Civil War too, knowing full well that the sequels are usually worse. Meanwhile in the world, New Zealand constructed a military factory, the Russians have lost 2 million men in Finland, and a lot is happening in and around China. There I was on HMS Hood, pride of the fleet, yes, when BANG! 50 or so newspapers dumped on my desk, all about some kind of factionalism in China. <laughs> Gave me a damned headache. Well that and the uh, day-night cycle stuck on 4 speed, that was f***ing ghastly, yes. It was about then when uh, time started to slow down, which was quite a relief, I must tell you. It's the morning of the 1st of January 1938. The day starts normally for British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, as he guarantees the independence of Czechoslovakia after breakfast, and then Norway during his lunch. But something isn't right. Time appears to be moving incredibly slowly all of a sudden. It seems the leader of the Netherlands is having trouble keeping up, due to either a piss-poor PC or internet connection. This slow progress angers Kaiser Wilhelm II, and he declares war on the Dutch. The British, having guaranteed them at some point during dinner last night, jumps into the war and invites their allies, the French. The events of January 1st, 1938 will go down in history. Amelia Earhart circumnavigates the globe, the Hindenburg nearly crashes, and the Second World War begins. Known now as the Great War II Electric Boogaloo, the opening moves are made by the Kaiser's forces as they launch attacks into Europe's speed bump, otherwise known as Belgium. And there we were, looking into the Netherlands. It's so very flat you can see for miles. We stopped there and we assumed the rather trim and fit Robert von Grime, the head of the Air Force, persuaded the Kaiser he could finish him off from the air, but that wasn't it. At this point, the Dutch are praying for a miracle, and they receive one. As the German forces approach their border, Suddenly, their entire advance comes to a stop. The leader of Sweden had just hot-joined, and the game had paused. 
everything everywhere stood still. Up to this point, Sweden hasn't been in the game at all, but then they are. They worry at first, should they go into business making something like flat pack furniture? But they decide on arms and weaponry instead, and they build them in huge numbers. Time begins to move again, and the Swedish begin to flood the international market and sell every piece of military equipment they make in return for civilian production, which they then in turn use to build more military factories. It's a vicious capitalist cycle, according to the Soviets who end up fighting Swedish-made Bofors guns in Finland within weeks. In July of 1938, the Swedes come out with a tank design. AB Landsverk come up with a fantastic vehicle. It's sitting there behind me. Other countries, Russia, they're coming out with some rubbish called the T-34, the Americans, the Sherman. And of course, those insignificant Germans crapping out a load of utter rubbish the Swedes are the ones that are coming up with the best ideas. Now the new Swedish tank has not got much in the way of firepower or armour protection, but it does have that crucial ingredient that any expert on tanks will be able to tell you. It's amphibious. Whilst the Swedish made everybody wait, crucial time has been given to the Allied powers. Thank God time stopped, that's all I'll say. Gave us a chance to turn off that bloody day-night cycle, and once we did, we could see the map, and that was important. Yes, of course then it was time to dispatch the BEF to France to fight the Hun, and that they did. Yes, of course our war support was dreadfully low, and our leader kept complaining that he, he would have rather have led Germany, and that he only picked Britain because it was one of the few options left. Yeah, safe to say we weren't confident in the war to come. So, the first thing the Dutch do when they see the Germans approaching is flood their own country. Now, they have heard rumors that the Germans were about to launch the Bismarck and concluding that the sea level rise associated with such a large ship launching would submerge their country anyway, will they just go ahead and flood it? The Dutch, having saved nature a huge job by dropping themselves below sea level, decide to buy the new Swedish tank in droves called Sustrumming. They decide to call the new vehicle Sustrumming because it spends all of its time in the water and it stinks a rotting fish. The Germans, having already fought a vicious civil war, are already low on equipment. The prospect of attacking the Dutch forces with a water crossing penalty is not an appealing one. Just then, disaster strikes. An armada of Swedish built amphibious tanks are sailing towards them. They panic as they have no such technology. The Germans, of course, never really get into the idea of the tank. They are spending their time, energy and research resources onto heavy bombers, strategic bombers for long-range bombing campaigns. They stop in their tank design at Panzer II, a tank that was really there for training and not at all amphibious, and therefore I've lost complete interest in it. The Germans then panic by hundreds of the very same Swedish amphibious Suostroming tanks they're fighting. What takes place next is the most confusing tank battle in history. Meanwhile to the south, the Anglo-French forces aren't sitting idle. The Kaiser was banking on them playing a defensive game, but to his horror, the Allies are throwing themselves at German lines. In a move of desperation, the Germans call the Italians into the war, whose forces move in to help defend the German lines as soon as they've had lunch. It's the Great War all over again, except that this time both sides had improved infantry equipment too. The results are devastating. The tactics the Allies were using were reminiscent of the Great War I. You know, it felt almost criminal gunning them down. Though I wouldn't know anything about criminal behavior at all. Are we done? Oui, oui, le, le plan est simple derrière du fromage de charge. Mais j'espère le lancer l'acte d'organisation de force de stop. Donc là je tire les, les standard petit second and uh, avant recharge and uh, recharge. Uh, ad nouveau. June 20th, 1940. Both the Allies and Central Powers are at stalemate, along the same lines they fought over just 20 years prior. Both are bleeding themselves dry as the Swedish industrial machine is producing material at record levels. Back in the USSR, History is also repeating itself, as a full-blown revolution is taking place due to the mismanagement of the Winter War. History will note that Stalin should have been worried about his own officer corps, and should have probably purged them at some stage. 
whilst the Soviets kill themselves in record numbers. The Kaiser sends personal messages to Italian dictator Mussolini, demanding he attacks in North Africa and pushes the British back to the Suez Canal, but it's not possible. The battle in North Africa never really gets off the ground. Both sides face each other and dig in and fail to build up an infrastructure or supply lines and support. Attrition wears both sides down and they end up facing each other across what we might call no man's sand. 9th of April 1941, the Americans finish their civil war. The fascists have won and so declare war on their natural enemies, the Canadians. The British Prime Minister rushes to try and guarantee Canada, only to realise they're already in the Commonwealth, and like most historians, he'd just forgotten about them. Of course, when the Americans attacked the Canadians, we moved every division we had across the entire world there, from Singapore to another colony. They all went there, which, as it turns out, was a tremendous cock-up. Yes. It's the 6th of December, and as US Marines storm over Lake Superior to invade Canada, the Pacific Fleet also launch a surprise strike against the Japanese Navy, docked in Hiroshima. The Japanese are shocked, as they were about to do the same thing to the Americans at Pearl Harbor. The city of Hiroshima has never and will never see devastation like it. Meanwhile, the Swedish decide that now is the time to make their play. They attack Norway, expecting everyone else to barely take notice. But the British World Police don't let their Scandinavian weapons suppliers get away with it. Neville Chamberlain delivers an ultimatum to the Swedes. The Swedes believe this is a bluff, but being literally unable to make peace with the Norwegians, decide to storm forwards towards Oslo. Aha! Sweden declares war on Norway. Now the Norwegians are thinking the Swedes can't take on me, but they absolutely can. They see Oslo and say, gimme, 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 and of course, in this game, the winner takes it all. It's the 1st of April 1943. After Norway, the Swedish launch their most audacious plan yet, one the British don't see coming, which is strange as they've been investing all their time and attention into spying. The Swedes launch a naval invasion towards the British Isles. The British public aren't worried, as everybody knows that the Royal Navy's home fleet stationed in Scarpa Flow wouldn't allow such an invasion to take place. Except, in a shocking moment of laxity, the British leadership forget to order the fleet out of port. I was absolutely furious watching the Vikings sailing their invasion force into Northumbria. We sat idly by in HMS Hood. I was disappointed. I wanted to prove how effective and resilient a ship she was. I never got the chance. So the Swedish invasion, they proceed south, pillaging, burning, growing their hair long. They hope to meet the English army under Alfred around fleet services. With the British army tied up in France and Canada, the defence of the country is left to a single rushed out division of Home Guard, based in Norfolk. Well, I tried to join up a few times before 1943, but boy then they were scraping the barrel and they were, they were willing to look past my deficiencies and let me join the Home Guard. Now, turned out there was actually a reason for that because the Swedish were about to invade. Well, they caught us just outside the fleet service gap, between Basingstoke and Farnborough. Uh, we, we gave them a good going, but we were no match for their ST divisions. The Swedes come up with a new tactical formation, the Super Trooper Division. What happens there is 30 or 40 of these new amphibious tanks are actually mingled in amongst the men, and they go forward in a whole line, working their way towards the enemy. Of course, some countries who were not used to tank warfare thought that concentrating tanks would be a much better use of them, you know, for breakthrough attacks. Tosh, they got it wrong. Now, this successful tactic leads to ABBA naming a song Super Trooper after this great battle. The British lose London and soon the entire British Isles. The French can't believe it. And then, they just about lose their minds when they see Swedish marines in their now infamous amphibious tanks sailing up the Seine and landing in central Paris. Just avant d'aller sur ton tout CV capitule. Un moment. Our president de la runoff is a disappear, Gasly. Oui. Nobody can reach him. We pawns the connection there cut off. Others pawns he uh, quit de la rage. We we don't uh, we don't talk about that. 
But uh, the goal. Oh, the goal. Je t'aime, the goal. The goal uh, is the title general general. It wasn't great. After the Swedes sacked Paris, they turn on the German Empire. In a matter of weeks, the Swedish forces are capturing various remote and lesser heard of towns in order to force a German capitulation. The Kaiser can't believe it's happening again. He prepares himself for another Versailles-style humiliation in a train carriage, but there isn't a single civilian train left in the country. The Swedish then declare war on their last rivals, the United States. They are, however, aware that as every American citizen is armed, Invading the country as it stands is a grim prospect, so they make history. August 1945. The Swedes dropped two atomic bombs on Houston and New York. One, one each, you know, not two each. Right? Thinking that that would end the war. In reality, they still had to invade and physically take over most of the states first. However, by the end of 1947, they have succeeded, and so the United Planet of Sweden is created. Fans for ye va do your best. Fans for ye va vi elskade. Fans for ye for fun. Historians and people who claim to be argue whether the atom bombs saved lives or not. The 2nd of September 1947. The Swedish have achieved world domination. 80 years on, the planet of Sweden is a vibrant place, though the world's fish stocks are in shocking decline due to overfishing and canning. The war is often celebrated with parades, and more recently, by video games. Hello everybody, we'd like to thank Paradox Interactive for sponsoring this video. Please do go and support us by checking out the new DLC for Hearts of Iron 4 called Arms Against Tyranny. It's very fun, it's good, I enjoyed it and it was the basis for this entire video, so thank you to them. We'd also like to thank our friends over at the Tank Museum at Bobbington, and in particular David Willey for being an absolute legend and saying whatever we can learn to say. Do go and check out their channel on YouTube, and you can actually buy one of those tank tops he's wearing on their website, so go and do that. Then we'd like to thank the Operation Room. Hang on, it says the Operations Room on his channel. There must be a typo. Francis, you've got a typo on your channel. Y you might fix that. Anyway, he does amazingly well-researched and animated breakdowns of wars and battles. Just go and look, it's bloody amazing. And lastly, we'd like to thank Indy Nidell for choosing to risk his very good reputation and agreeing to collaborate with us on this. He is a gentleman and a scholar. Go and watch the YouTube channel World War II now. Uh, obviously, watch all of our videos first, but he's so bloody nice. Yeah, and handsome. Anyway, cheerio. Though he never had a chance to build a bunker, so he just just shoots himself in the Reich Chancellery Garden, like right out there in the open. And there was even a guy there. His name was Steve. Now, I remember that because Steve is a rather unusual name for a German. See, that's a little memory trick historians use, right? Then a dog got to the body. And, you know, unlike me in this outfit and with his hair, it was not pretty. Here's the thing, though. We do not know if it was Hitler's dog or Steve's dog. The historiography is pretty divided on this too. David Glantz wrote one of his 900 page impenetrable behemoths on the shooting and the six weeks leading up to it in Hitler's and Steve's life. It's called The Body in the Chancellery. Funny enough, there is another book with the same title written by Agatha Christie. Uh, it doesn't really mention Hitler at all though. It's mostly about some Belgian guy actually. It is, though, a much more gripping read than the David Glantz one, so I would go for that if I was you.